Chodesh Tov, a good Chodesh, to all of our participants. Uh, wonderful to be with you. A good Chodesh. It's Chodesh uh, Adar. Here we are. And this year we have two months of other. I suppose that when Hashem told us it does, doesn't cost anything to smile, so we said, we'll take two of those. That's what I was told, uh, you know, when Hashem asked all the nations if they want uh, the Torah, and each nation asked, well, what does it say there? And so Hashem begins telling them the mitzvahs. And B'nai Yishmol, B'nai Esav, and these and those, each said, no, 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 thanks, that's not for us. We're, we're, we're fine without that. When Hashem asked the Jewish people, do you want my Torah? He said, how much does it cost? He said, it's free. He'll give us two. So that's why there are two tablets. I'm assuming that Chayda Shodr, we also, you know, we, we heard it's free to smile, and, and uh, a smile could accomplish so much. So... We got two months of other, uh, at least this year. So, Mishalichnas other Marvin Basimcha, as other enters, and today other has entered, meaning that from the first day of Reish uh, Chaydash other, although it's technically still Shvat, other has already began. As a matter of fact, the Rev has pointed out that Mishalichnas other even includes from Shabbos Mavarchim, from the preceding Shabbos, when we bless the month of Adar, already then, Marab and Basimcha, we increase in joy. <clears throat> so, we hope to discuss a little today about the importance, significance, the value, the necessity for Simcha, for joy in general, and and then perhaps about the additional joy that we have in the month of other. One can argue that the imperative to be joyful even before even before approaching Torah mitzvahs, before approaching our relationship with Hashem. is a moral imperative that a person should be, so to say, required to be joyful, joyous, and uh, good-natured, optimistic, in a good mood, even just for one's own surroundings, meaning that a person's uh, per, when a person is besimcha, a person is in a state of joy, that person is much more pleasant to his or her surroundings and to those who he or she encounters. So when a person is radiating joy, everyone else is enjoying their presence. When a person is sulking or radiating the reverse and has a pessimistic outlook or is getting annoyed by everything that's going on or some things that are going on, that person is less pleasant to be around and people enjoy their presence less. And in order to be kind to others and to do, other to, to do unto others that which you would like done to yourself, it would seem that a person should be required to be a simcha, a person should be required to be happy and in good, in good spirits simply for the sake of those around him. It would go then without saying that we owe it to our spouses, to our children, that they should have an enjoyable person, an enjoyable spouse, enjoyable parent, 
that is that that is constantly with them. And even if, well, maybe we don't owe it technically, and maybe one could say, do they really deserve it? But as far as our as far as our relationship to others, in the sense that we should be trying to be as as good and good nature to others and make them feel comfortable and pleasant. So it would be our duty to be in good spirits constantly, again, if only for the sake of others. Then there's what many of us might be familiar with in Tanya, which actually we're be- we will be studying this chapter. Yeah, this chapter, uh, the coming in the coming days, in the daily study cycle, uh, the annual study, uh, study cycle of the Tanya, in the daily shear of the Tanya for the next few days, we'll be studying chapter twenty six, uh, and there. We will find, no, it's actually one day, sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, tomorrow. And there we will find how the author of Tanya addresses the importance to be the simcha, to be happy in general and in serving Hashem in particular. And as the the author of Tanya points out, when one is struggling with an opponent, and we are always struggling with an opponent, namely our own evil inclination, or more generally speaking, our own natural soul, animalistic self, with which we are constantly struggling, so it's known that the, 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 the nature in any strong one, in any wrestling match, so to say, is that when one becomes, when one becomes uh, lazy or unmotivated or of a heavy, uh, of, you know, of a heavy, uh, or a, a, a non-agile position, then he is easily overcome. So in order to succeed in our struggle against our more animalistic side, and to succeed in our struggle against the evil inclination, it would be necessary then to be always with much vigor. And since Simcha is what gives a person, uh, since when a person is a Simcha, they are filled with energy. And the opposite of Simcha, when a person is sad or depressed or unhappy, they are sort of drained of their energy. Drained of their energy and without motivation. And so a person is then easily overcome regarding anything that he would be struggling with. And this will be true, and the Rebbe points this out in in quite a few letters, as far as I've seen at least. The Rebbe points this out, that this will be true even with regard to one's personal affairs. It was not just in regard to serving Hashem and, uh, and observing the mitzvahs, but in one's personal affairs, one's daily activities, a person would be better off if he, when he was, when he was in good spirits, when he was full of joy, and, there, and thereby full of energy. So even just to function in the most optimal way, and even for a person to simply succeed in any of his endeavors, in all of his endeavors, it would do him well 
to expose himself to an extra dose of joy. So thus far we have established that with regard to a person's relationship to others, simcha is beneficial to the others. With a person's, uh, with regard to a person's relationship with himself, simcha would be beneficial, meaning that when a person is joyful, he is more energized and more bound to succeed in whatever he's doing. And similarly, in a person's relationship with Hashem, as one may say, these are the three uh, dimensions of relationships that a person constantly has with Hashem, with others, and with himself. And similarly with Hashem, as the al points out, like we noted, a person is more bound to succeed in fulfilling what Hashem wants and overcoming his natural instincts, his animalistic drives, or even his own uh, un, uh, a lack of uh, motivation to fulfill Hashem's will by, by being in a state of simcha, of joy, and in, in good spirits. Taking this a step further, when a person is unhappy, when a person is dejected or depressed, or even just frustrated, ultimately the person is feeling that negative feeling because of how absorbed he is in his own situation or because of how important his own experience and central to his, to his own experience is to him. So in other words, if a person were to be less uh, less uh, fixed on his own, let's say the, the importance of his own experiences, if a person were to, to be more fixed on what is objectively important, he would have much less reason to be upset. Of course, we are subjective people, and it's natural that we that we consider what happens to us more important than what's happening not to us. However, since the since a major focus in Torah in general and Hasidus in particular is to be focused on what Hashem wants and to be focused on Torah mitzvahs and to be focused on a on a more objective reality than the subjective reality that we typically experience and to be focused on the true reality of Ein Oid Milvadoi of there's nothing other than Hashem in its purest and truest sense that there is nothing no existence at all outside of Hashem's existence outside of the reality of Hashem and the more we would be in in contact with that awareness, the more we would be in sync with with that uh, awareness, that that uh, recognition, that consciousness, we would be so much less frustrated or annoyed or dejected or depressed by whatever it is that is putting us in that state. Which brings us to recognize that since bittle or self-nullification plays such an important and central role in, in Hasidic thought, and in general, as mentioned in, in the 
Torah outlook, and even as also as mentioned, it, it, from a purely philosophical standpoint, it's clear that objective reality is is more truthful, is more uh, should have more authenticity, more value than our own perception. So the the experience that brings us to the opposite of Simcha is one which is really losing touch with, with the truth, in a sense. And it's one which is certainly losing touch with a more accurate and more proper focus on what really matters, what matters most. So being Basimcha then would be both a cause and an effect of a more proper and a more uh, a more mature and a more accurate outlook on everything that goes on and everything that doesn't go on and everything that should go on and should not go on and on everything excuse me and uh, and, and on everything that we perceive questions any questions i should just mention everyone's um uh, muted so if you want to ask anything just unmute yourself and uh, yes uh, uh anna just unmute yourself you're muted we cannot hear you Probably on the bottom left, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I just would like to refer or to recommend a book that is exactly in the same line of what you just explained. It's written by a Dennis Prager and it's called That Happiness is a Serious Problem. And it is something that I purchased as a gift to both of my kids immediately. It's just a small brochure, but in addition to everything that you just explained, which is 150% I agree with, um, it gives tools how to actually develop this. And I like one of his phrases where he compares a bad mood to a bad breath. And he is saying that exactly as you're not entitled to spoil someone else's <laughs> existence, does not brushing your teeth, you have to work on developing certain skills, how to really make yourself at least presenting yourself in a happy way. And then it becomes your second nature. That's why this subject is really, really something that is extremely important. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you brought it all in a more philosophical way, because I knew how to deal with it, but you show the nature of it. You show the causes of it, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I would love to continue. Thank Nothing you, Anna. To be sorry for. <laughs> have I, have, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, Susan. I just, I just uh, re, uh, re respond to Anna's words. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad you enjoyed, and thanks for uh, bringing that up. You know, for bringing that up. The that uh, thought that it's something along the lines of, you know, a bad a bad mood, something along the lines of bad breath. And sort of toxic, right? It's uh, it's a good way to, to look at it. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, when you said that you were, when you're unhappy, did you say that the soul seems to be drained, or you didn't say the soul is drained? I'm I just didn't mention. I didn't use that phraseology, but that wouldn't be far from from accurate in, in the sense that the soul is not drained of its, of its uh, identity. It's not drained of its uh, holiness by any means. 
But yes, in a sense, the soul is drained of its strength, not in its potential oh, strength. Okay. Right. Now so I the understand. soul is not of its potential strength. The soul is still able to okay. do anything it was able to do yesterday. But the soul's energies are sort of all depleted. Depleted. In 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 regards to uh, one's actual behavior. And that could that could come from anything outside source, or it could come from within. Correct. Either way. In other words, whether the happiness, excuse me, whether the unhappiness is sort of provoked from it without could, or from within. Right. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So from here we proceed to the importance okay. of. We have a question from you. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out an example in the Torah of what you're saying. Yaakov, when he was depressed because of uh, Yosef, uh, he thought Yosef had died. He didn't receive prophecy. Correct. Correct. As a matter of fact, all the Nabiim, as a general rule, would only receive prophecy when they were in good spirits. Right. Uh, as Rashi uh, actually says, clearly, I mean, it's, it's not the earliest source, but Rashi even brings it in his Pirush, that Ein simcha. the prophetic song could be sung only from, from a from a state of joy. And all the Nevi'im would have to be in a state of joy in order to, in order to, uh, to, to obtain prophecy, you know, to, uh, to make that communicate, to receive that communication from Hashem of prophetic vision. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, Right. Okay. Let's let's not uh, uh, diverse uh, di diverge too much, but yes. So so all the prophets were required. It was, it was like sort of a, a a requisite for prophecy at the time of the prophecy was to be to be in a state of happiness. And yeah, in Tehillim also we find that there are various uh, terms at the beginning of the chapters of Tehillim, and two of the most common are Mizmor Ladovid and Ladovid Mizmor. What is the difference? So the commentaries explain that when it says Ladovid Mizmor, that means that David, David HaMelech, who wrote this psalm, when he would receive, when he received this prophecy, he sang this song. In other words, the song in the psalm of Tilim is a is a response to the prophecy which he received. When it says Mizmer the David, it means that the song that he's saying actually prompted the prophecy. So that's the difference in the order. Is it the song that prompted the prophecy or the prophecy that prompted the song? When it's Mizmer the David, a song to uh, to David Amalek. So it's, it's telling us that the, the mizmor, the song, brought about the prophecy which David HaMelech had. When it's saying the David mizmor, it's the prophecy which David HaMelech had prompted the song. But in any event, we see that uh, the prophecy is very much connected with happiness, whether it was a result thereof or was a, was a catalyst to that happiness. Uh, going, uh, connecting it actually with a little, with uh, the month of other, mm -hmm. now that you brought it up, there's uh, uh, a, a fascinating uh, explanation for a point in the Megillah, in the story of Purim, where there are many explanations, but th this one's very much related to what we're discussing, so we'll bring it up which actually indicates that 
not only is joy uh, necessary and perhaps um, productive in order to reach spiritual heights, but as you mentioned at the beginning, was the, I guess the first point about happiness is that it, or excuse me, not the first, the second point about happiness, that it's productive even in one's personal affairs. It makes a person more, more likely to succeed. So in, with regard to the question of why did Esther not breach her, her ambitious request to Ahasuerus at the first feast, when she invited Ahasuerus and Haman to feast with her. She comes there, they come there, and you know, whining and dining. And then when Akashver says, so my dear queen, what would you like? She basically says, well, how about tomorrow, I'll tell you. Okay, so what was she thinking in the first place? Was she expecting to push it off till tomorrow? Was she, was she, in other words, did she have, was her plan ruined somehow? What happened here? What was her original plan? So the Gemara gives many responses, uh, many different answers to this question. And it's amazing how the Gemara, uh, the Gemara concludes that one of the great sages was told by Elio Anavi when asked, so which of these was Esther's intent? In fact, is what was Esther really thinking? These are all good suggestions, but there must be something that was actually her plan. There must have been some reason why she actually made this move and told Achashverosh, how about come tomorrow, we'll do this over. And you know, then I'll tell you. So Elio Anovi answered, she was thinking all of them. All of these reasonings, all of these ideas were on Esther's mind and all of them were the cause for her decision. So anyway, there's an interesting explanation. One, like I said, there's many explanations to this uh, phenomenon. But what, and one of them is that Esther saw that Haman was so proud and enjoying himself so much at this meal, at this feast. Imagine he's thinking to himself, I am the only person in the whole kingdom who's invited to a special feast with the queen, with Queen Esther, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the love of uh, King Ahasuerus is doing anything for her to get her to, to, to disclose her, 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 her background, her identity, and so on. And here, this Esther, who is so beloved to the king, who does she invite to the feast with him? Just me. And he can't get over it. He's in such, he's, he's, he's just loving every minute of it. Um, yeah, he, he's loving every minute of it. And Esther sees that he is so happy, so, so proud, and so in such good spirits so upbeat, she says to herself, someone who's so happy, I won't be able to defeat them. Let's try again tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow he won't be in such good spirits. He won't be so happy and so optimistic and so excited. Maybe then I'll have a better chance. Of course, taking into account that there was, was a serious Gezeira and Shemayim, and it, it was not going to be easy to, you know, she, she had, a, she was working against something really difficult. So she recognized someone who is in such good spirit, someone who is so joyful at this moment, I, I don't think I have a chance. Let's wait and try again tomorrow. Sure enough, tomorrow, Haman comes back, humiliated, defeated, and bereft. He's, he's, uh, he, he lost a daughter, he got 
garbage dumped on his head in the middle, in, you know, in the streets of Shushan. He was ridiculed wherever he went. And worst of all, he was the one who had to lead Mordechai, to, uh, to escort Mordechai throughout the streets of Shushan, exclaiming his greatness when he was here about to, you know, when he was uh, scheming how to end his life on this very day. Instead, everything turns over, and Mordechai is riding in the king's clothing, in the royal, wearing the royal crown, and Haman is his servant, schlepping uh, the horse around, proclaiming to everyone the greatness of Mordechai. And this is how Haman comes to the feast, a total wreck. Esther says, now is my chance. Because when a person is happy, when a person is in good spirits, they are much less easily defeated. So again, um, just, uh, I, along the same lines of uh, of the Navua, how it only it only would uh, transpire, and as you saw, by, as you mentioned by Yaakov Avinu as well, he was not able to have Navua for as long as he was uh, wow. mourning, wow. although erroneously mourning Yosef Hatzal. Um, I see Ben has a question. Uh, sure, can, you, can you take questions? Okay, yeah, ben. I, wanted, I really wanted to make a comment that it, it's not just Nebuah that, that you have to be happy when you receive it, but especially Nebuah. But you have to be happy with anybody that talks to you because if you show, you know, a bad behavior or, or face, you know, faces that you are not happy with what he's saying, he's not going to talk to you. He's not going to continue saying it. But the same is with Nevoah. If you don't appreciate the reception of Nevoah, you're not going to receive it next time. Right. You have to show appreciation to God. Reminds me of the uh, uh, a, 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 say a certain a wealthy businessman wanted to buy a, a skyscraper. And he comes to the site after making up uh, to meet with the owner. And, you know, this is before the days of cell phones. And he, he arrives, the owner is not there yet. So he figures he'll go up and, you know, go up into the building and see. He brought with him a, a briefcase full of cash. A uh, suitcase full of cash, and he goes up. Uh, he goes up the elevator all the way up to the top floor. He's looking around from the windows, enjoying, and he sees the stairs going up to a to a higher floor. He goes up the stairs, and it's still like sort of unfinished, maybe under construction or not entirely finished. And he walks into the into this uh, you know into this top floor, and the door slams behind him. And sooner soon enough, he realizes the door which slammed behind him and locked automatically has no handle from inside, and he's locked inside again with no phone, no way of communicating. And with all of his millions and millions of dollars, he can do nothing to get himself out of this building, you know, out of this uh, locked room, floor. And he has no way of even informing anyone that he's there. And who's ever going to check here? You know, by the time anyone will find him, he'll be rotting. So he's, uh, uh, you know, an intelligent person starts thinking, what can I do? How can I get myself out of here? You know, he goes, there are windows. He goes to the windows and starts yelling and hollering, but no one can hear anything. He's dozens and dozens of stories above ground and, and no one's hearing anything. So he has an idea. He has tons of money with him, but he's not, you know, <laughs> doesn't seem to be helping him. So he starts throwing $100 bills out of the window to get people's attention. You no, know, look up here, this way, this way. He's throwing $100 bills out of the window and people are walking by 
and picking them up. No surprise. Picking them up and continuing on their way. And as much as he throws money out the window to get people's attention, no one is looking up to see where the money's coming from. It doesn't seem to be a major concern. Uh, they're just picking up the money and, and moving on. And even when he throws down like uh, bundles of $100 bills, they're just being picked up and, and you know, just being uh, gathered as they fall. That's it. And no one's, he's not getting anyone's attention. This is not working, obviously. So he takes, he sees that, you know, like we said, it's uh, under construction or some kind of, you know, he, he sees cinder blocks. He says, I'll throw a cinder block out the window. Throws a cinder block out the window, smashes a car. Immediately, the owner looks up and says, who did that? What's going on? Ultimately, that's how we got out of the building. So the uh, probably apparent enough uh, nimshal, but not so uh, not so pleasant nimshal is that oftentimes Hashem wants to get our attention, and as much as He showers us with brachas and good, it doesn't necessarily get our attention, unfortunately. And as soon as some something painful, something difficult strikes, we automatically look up. Where did that come from? All right. Well, I was trying to give you lots of stuff to, to get your attention. You know, if you should say, hey, where is this coming from? But unfortunately, somehow there's this tendency among people, the human race is sort of maybe wired like that. I don't know. But there's this tendency to look for the source of, of, of trouble you know, more so than we look for the source of, uh, of good and blessing and, and success. Maybe take it for granted. So, of course, the, the moral of that story would be, let's, let's, not, let's not give Hashem any reason to try to get our attention by other means. Let's be thankful and let's appreciate all the good we have. So thanks for sharing that. To, to, to go, to take this a step further now, again, with regard to keeping Torah mitzvahs, the Torah explicitly enjoins us to, well, at least according to the uh, explanation of the Arizal, there's a Pasuk in Parshas Kisavi, the Parsha of the Toichachan, the rebuke towards the end of the Torah, which actually, uh, interestingly enough, this is the season when Meshur Rabbeinu was reading, when we, was reciting these parshas to, to Am Yisrael between Rish Chayda Shvat and Zion Adar. So this must have been around this time that Meshur Rabbeinu was saying, parshas Kisavi and so on. We find a pasuk that all these troubles have befallen you, the Jewish people. Because you have not served Hashem, your God, the simple meaning would be would read in times of joy when you had much of everything. In other words, when everything was good and you had uh, prosperity, good health, plenty of reason to, uh, you, you had every, all, all the reasons to be able to focus on doing, on keeping Torah mitzvahs. And still, you weren't uh, dedicated enough to that cause. So all these troubles are befallen. However, the, that's, the, that's a simple explanation. The Arizal reads the Pasuk in a more literal sense, perhaps, and reads it as, because you did not serve Hashem, 
with happiness when you had everything. When you had much of everything, you could have served Hashem with happiness. Meaning that the Torah is, is expecting us to serve Hashem with joy. And as we read in Tehillim, If and he's supposed to rejoice in doing the mitzvah. And a person is supposed to be excited by the mitzvah. It shouldn't be a burden on us, chas v'shalom. So serving Hashem with joy means that the mitzvah has value to us. And it also means that we are enthusiastic about doing this. So Hashem wants us to do the mitzvah with, our, with all of our enthusiasm. That, that would basically mean keeping the mitzvah, and we'd be observing the mitzvah in a joyful manner. So since the Torah expects us to keep all the mitzvahs and, and do so in, from a state of joy, that's what the Torah is saying. Since this wasn't done, that's why Chas Shalom, these troubles have befallen. There's a, a word from the Kotzker, right? I remember correctly, just a minute. Ah, right. <laughs> so the, the Kotzker asks on this explanation of the Arizal, Were, are all of these curses induced just from the fact that we didn't serve Hashem with joy? That's what the reason is saying, that we are supposed to serve Hashem with joy. And since we didn't, this is what's happened. So that could be simply understood as all the myths are supposed, be, are supposed to be done with joy. But since we didn't do them, then these curses are befalling us. But the Kutzker Rebbe would ask, it seems to be implying, according to their real explanation, that the problem is not that we didn't do the mitzvahs, which are meant to be done with joy, but that even though we did the mitzvahs, we didn't do them with joy. The joy is what was lacking. So ask the Rebbe Mendel of Kutz, could it be that there's such a, a severe punishment just for not keeping the mitzvahs from a state of joy, even though we fulfilled the mitzvahs, but we didn't fulfill them happily enough. Which is what seems to be the simple, uh, you know, the, 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 that's how we, he understood the simple meaning of the Pasuk, according to the Rizal's explanation. And the Rizal is definitely emphasizing with this explanation the importance of keeping the mitzvahs Joyously. That's what it's all about. It's so important to keep the mitzvahs and to perform the mitzvahs with simcha. But could it be that there's such a severe punishment just for not doing the mitzvahs in a happy and with such enthusiasm, even though we actually did the mitzvahs? So Ramando Kotzka would read the Pasuk that it's Tachas Ashaleya Vartas Tachas Ashaleya Vartas Shamalikacha Vesimcha. It's because you did not serve Hashem, and that you did happen. It's because the it's the it's because the transgressions were done enthusiastically, and that is certainly a severe enough uh, a severe enough cause for for the chas v'shalom such uh, all, all the curses that are mentioned. Here. Anyway, but that's uh, that was a little going a bit, a bit going off on the side, so. Since we have to serve Hashem with joy, all the mitzvahs are supposed to be done with joy. And since we have to always be serving Hashem, so we have to always be in a state of joy. We're always supposed to be doing a mitzvah. There are certain mitzvahs that are done uh, every moment of our lives. There are certain mitzvahs that we're never allowed to uh, cease from their fulfillment, like 
love of Hashem, awe of Hashem, belief or understanding of Hashem's unity. So these, these are constant mitzvahs. Besides that, we're always presented with opportunities to do a mitzvah. And even when we're involved in our worldly affairs, we're supposed to be doing them the way Hashem wants and for the purpose that Hashem wants, kol masecha yilushin shemaim, that all our actions should be for the sake of heaven, b'chod we should know Hashem in all of our ways, in other words, be experiencing our connection with Hashem in everything we're doing, literally everything. So it's not just about the actual mitzvah observance in which we are connecting with Hashem, which we're supposed to be doing through happiness and enthusiastically. Another point is uh, I, this, this the Rebbe once said at a Fabrengen, it's not a, a typical, and those, these are all, I guess, fundamental ideas that we've brought up so far, uh, fundamental ideas in, in Hasidic teachings. But the Rebbe once made mention of a, another idea of why Simcha is so important and why it's constantly important. Why a person has to be constantly in a perennial state of joy. We know that a, we know that the purpose of creation in general and our mission in life, each of us in particular, is because Hashem desired to have a dira betachtein, a home in the lowest realm. Meaning that, meaning that uh, we are supposed to bring Hashem's presence and reveal Hashem in, our, in all of our daily activities and ultimately in, in the entire world. The world should become a home for Hashem. So since we are supposed to be in every moment of our lives somehow advancing this project, somehow reaching, uh, coming closer to the, the completion of this purpose, doing our part in this mission, fulfilling our role in, in Hashem's ultimate plan, in everything we do, in everything we say, in, in every encounter, everything is supposed to be about bringing Hashem, revealing Hashem's presence in this world and making this world a home for Hashem, making this, a, this world a place where Hashem could be at home. So since it says, uh, we mentioned this Pasuk also every day in Davening, we recite, there is strength and joy in his place. In other words, in Hashem's place, the place where Hashem is to be found, there is strength and joy. So since Hashem is only found in a place where there is joy, and we're supposed to make every place, every setting, every environment, every, uh, every opportunity, we're supposed to make it into uh, a, a, an opportunity, a place, a, a, an encounter, which can be hospitable to Hashem's presence. So we have to constantly be in a state of simcha, in a state of joy, in order to facilitate that. Anyway, that's not, that's a, another another uh, from another angle, the importance of simcha in serving Hashem. Any questions? So maybe uh, tell us uh, how a person uh, reaches the uh, simcha. Um, <laughs> I know that's like the million dollar question. People go to therapy for years and decades right. <laughs> to get there. But uh, maybe give us some, some tips if this is the topic of the... Uh... Okay. Uh, we, we can do that uh, sort of quickly, just a, a couple of pointers. Uh, or we could uh, save that for another time, make a, a you know separate uh, class, perhaps even just about uh, 
attaining more simcha or a practical approach to simcha. But if to just give a couple pointers, one of the most uh, one of the most powerful things was actually brought up earlier. I think it was I think it was Anna who mentioned how important it is to be appreciative, thankful. When a person is thankful and a person is full of praise in, in speech, when a person tells others, thank you, I appreciate that, it's very hard for them to themselves become upset and and dejected by what's going on. They are kind of, when a person is saying, uh, giving thanks to other people, to Hashem, it puts the person in a certain mode of, hey, things are good. And a person begins to recognize how things truly are good. It's not like a person's fooling himself, but a person is, is really becoming more aware of, of, uh, of all the good that's around him. But even aside from the recognizing the good that's going on, a person who is thankful and a person who gives praise, certainly to Hashem, as well as to others, compliments will almost automatically be in better spirits and almost find it difficult to to just sink into depression another another uh, you, know, you know I guess in, in, in the same vein one could say when you wake up every morning, Find three things, identify three things for which you want to thank Hashem. Off the bat, as you start the day. I'm about to start this day. I'm about to do X, Y, Z. about to tackle a bunch of things I don't want to tackle, perhaps. And I'm about to, you know, you know, about to jump into all my tzaras, all my uh, 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 difficult, you know, whatever I have to be involved with and the, all the difficulties that entails. But before I do that, I want to thank Hashem for three things. And just choose three things that you are happy about. Three things that you want to thank Hashem for. In your, in your uh, personal situation, in that of your family, your health, prosperity, your general background, something that happened yesterday, something that's been going on lately, something that didn't happen, anything that uh, is just something that right now, this is something that uh, came to my mind or when contemplating this, I uh, recognized and I want to thank Hashem for it. To do this every morning, this short exercise, which could be literally less than a minute, could be more is something that really I think sets the tone for a person's day and makes a person much more uh, much more inclined to be happy throughout the day. When a person starts off the day just by identifying, let's find three things that are that are good, three things that are going on or that have always been going on or three things that just happened that I want to thank Hashem for. And I thank Hashem for that. I, uh, at, uh, I, 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 at uh, my Shabbos table, I would oftentimes, uh, for, for a, a period of time, we had this uh, routine where at the Friday night Shabbos meal, each of the children would say three things that they want to thank Hashem for. It was wonderful to hear. 
And it really sets a tone at the Shabbos table too, of a more upbeat and uh, enthusiastic and happy setting. In, in, uh, while, while we're on this, one might say that this finds expression, although it's certainly not the only basis, it's certainly not the, the whole meaning, the whole significance of the practice that Hazal instituted, but it certainly finds expression in the practice that Hazal instituted to begin the day with saying Maidan. The first thing we do, as soon as we wake up in the morning, we say Maidani. Our first, the first words that come, about, come out of our mouth, the first bit of communication, and one can argue even the first thought, because a person is supposed to say Maidani immediately when, when awakening. As soon as he is he, as soon as he's aware of himself, he recognizes that, oh. Right, I, I exist, right? The first thing that is supposed to happen, he says, Maidani. Thank you, Hashem, that you gave my neshama back to me. Rabbi Munasech, your trustworthiness is enormous. I can always rely on you. This is how a Jew starts off his day, telling Hashem thank you. Reflecting on all the good that Hashem does for us. And I think that's something that really sets the tone for the day and, and enables a person, if only he reflects a little bit on what he's saying, enables a person to be more happy throughout the day. Okay, Shkoyach, I see Isaac has a question. Our time is just about up. So, Isaac. Uh... Oh, okay, sure, go ahead. We can't hear you. Rabba and Munasecha, the last two words you said. It's not so much that I'm trusting in him, Hashem is trusting in me. Rabba and Munasecha, big is your faith in me that I'm going to do something with what you gave me. You gave it back to me that I should do something with it. It's not that our amuna is in Hashem at that point. He gave it to us. We're alive. That's what we thank. That's the way I learned what it means at the end. Right. So there is such an explanation, Rabbi Munasecha, that your faith in me, it's definitely an empowering thought and an, uh, an important thought. Uh, and I'm sure the Rebbe someplace said it. I'm sure. Yeah, someplace. yeah. No, it's a valid explanation. It's, it's, uh, there is such an explanation. Okay, good. Uh, the simple meaning, though, is as mentioned uh, that the, that Hashem's uh, trustworthiness in restoring our neshama to us is is great, and that's what we're thanking him for. Uh, the, the the two words actually, Rabbi Munasecha, come from a pasuk in Eicha, Chadoshim Labkarim Rabbi Munasecha. That's the simple meaning there. Although yes, there is definitely room for the the pshat that you mentioned. Okay, so thank, thank you so so much. Uh... Rabbi Lifshitz, that was a uh, wonderful, wonderful, uh, insightful, and educational uh, uh, class. Yasha Kayach. I just want to mention, um, number one, this week, for those of you that are locals, we have our Cafe Chai on Thursday. Uh, Thursday, a luncheon with a guest speaker. We've got a, uh, a special guest speaker, Rivka Goldstein, who's a uh, uh, best-selling author. Uh, and a uh, Harvard graduate, life coach, very interesting lady who um, really, uh, she has a, a whole journey that she took and very, very interesting. I want to keep you in suspense, so I'm not going to tell you uh, anymore, but uh, she is going to be speaking. There's a delicious luncheon. It's Thursday, 
in Hallandale at the uh, Cultural Community Center at 1230 free. If any of you want to join us, uh, you're all welcome. And uh, for those of you that don't come daily to our classes, I just want you to know that we have this three o'clock class every single day. Uh, it's not always a guest speaker and definitely not as good as we had today, but uh, we do have uh, uh, classes every single day at three o'clock. And I beg uh, to differ, Rabbi. It is just, as, it's wonderful. I beg to you. differ. <laughs> and uh, we have in the morning as well at 10 o'clock. So if any of you uh, that are uh, guests, uh, you're welcome to try out our other classes. Okay, Zai Gesund, everyone. And thank you again. That was a wonderful class. Yashu Kayach. Thank can you, I, Rabbi. Thank Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Bye. Can I ask, do you have any publications or any way of reading up on, on your ideas or, or any of the uh, additional details that we could find? Because especially now after COVID, it's such an important subject. It is just on time because there's, the spirit is so down. It would be wonderful to, to have more suggestions, more ideas. Do you have anything that we could follow up with? Uh, that I've written specifically on yeah. the subject? No, I don't. Uh, not, not, no, on the subject, I don't. And uh, I, I maybe, think maybe you should. Maybe this would be a good idea to start. I think we should encourage Rabbi Lipschitz to write a book about it. <laughs> that would, would yeah. be wonderful. Starting, starting with us. Thank you, Anna, for uh, initiating that thought. Thank you. So if I write the book, Anna gets 20% of the profits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not committing to anything. I don't know, whatever you want to give. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm committing. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can offer you 20% help if I could. <laughs> well, at, at least at least a few people have become happier. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I, you know, I think the difference is between an expectation and obligation. A person has to take it as an obligation. And if it, it starts with such a strong belief, with many repetitions, it become a habit first. Right. And then your personality second. Right. right. Yeah, that's that's what is what matters. Okay, right. thank you so much. It was wonderful, really wonderful to hear. You're very welcome. First of all, the explanation why it's so important. Okay. I'm glad you enjoyed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.